little bit. I mean, at least we're only talking two years of rental. And so I, for round numbers, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I want to say I, I bought it for 60. I put 25,000 into it. So it's really only still worth about 60, but I ended up being able to sell it for close to 90 because I could, I was financing it for somebody. So, so these people are looking for another way to one, build a rental portfolio or two, just have a house to live in themselves and add equity, add value to and live in it. And so that what I ended up doing is selling it to somebody for 90, they put $20,000 down and I carried the loan for them on a 25 year amateurization at a higher interest rate than what was at the time. And Hi everybody, Jose Luis Morales here. Welcome back to another episode of the Morales Group Show. Today we have a very special guest. His name is Austin Hancock. Uh, out of Oklahoma City, and today he is going to be answering the question, what is a contract for deed? I have never done a contract for deed. I've heard the name a couple of times, so I don't know very much about this topic, but I do know that it is a topic that viewers have been asking about. So welcome to the show, Austin. How are you? Good, man. How are you? Thanks for having me on. I love it. So for our viewers that don't know who you are is who is Austin Hancock and how did you get involved in this world of real estate investing? And specifically, how did you find out about contract for deeds as well too? Yeah. So uh, my story kind of starts um, as the contractor. So after I got, I got out of the Marine Corps in 2010, mm -hmm. I started my own construction business because that's what I grew up doing. And so um, I was just doing, I was running equipment, welding, things like that. I forgot the Marines going back into construction because I didn't know what else to do. And uh, I was pretty disgruntled. So I jumped right into, you know, construction. And then I realized uh, that I'd really like to start my own company. And, you know, somebody, I had a mentor at the time, somebody else that owned a business and kind of told me that I should start my own thing. And and so I did. My, the first thing I did was I I found a partner and somebody helped me finance a lot. And I started building houses. So I started becoming a builder, you know, a local builder. And I built one house and got a few custom houses off of that. Customs are houses that I, you know, you work one-on-one -on -one with somebody and um, you create the whole home for them. It's a full-blown custom bespoke style home. And so I started doing that and I was making money and I was, uh, you know, happy to make money, happy to not be working a job anymore or W2 running equipment. It was it beat the hell out of that. So um, I kept doing that. And then I realized that I had, I was missing out on, on real estate investing, you know, you, rentals were popular. The rich dad, poor dad book is, is super popular. And so I started reading, educating myself like most of us have. And I was like, Oh my God, there's so much I don't know. I know a little bit about business. I'm just getting started. So I went down the rabbit hole of real estate investing and started to really just consume any kind of content I could to educate myself. And that's where I started running across these courses or seminars and everything else. And remind you guys, this is back before like YouTube was even really popular where we didn't have a bunch of information that was free and abundant. Mm -hmm. um, so it was books, a few, a few good podcasts that were really out there, you know, bigger pockets was really kind of kicking off. Um, and so I was just gobbling up as much information as possible, trying to, I went from a W2 to working for myself, which was working 10 times more for more pay, but uh, it was, you know, I'm still, I'm still working, I'm working hard, yeah. you know, and I'm, I wanted the financial freedom that was always sold with real estate investing. And so uh, I reached out to a friend of mine that was kind of in it, or I connected in that realm and he sold me a rental, you know, I was still building, but I was, I, was like, I could still, you know, manage and redo a house and make it a rental. And I did that, that very first house and bought it from him, which ended up, I had no idea what a wholesaler was. I had no idea what off market was. I didn't even know anything about that side of the world. I mean, I literally from construction, I knew how to build, I knew how to trim, I knew how to frame, I knew how to manage projects that I knew how to grow that company. I didn't know anything about the real estate investing world. And so uh, I bought that property and I redid it and I put a tenant in there. I put a tenant in there for like two years. And when the tenant left, the house was falling apart. You know, the house was dilapidated. They didn't take care of it. I, I was a poor manager. I didn't know how to manage a property. I didn't have anything set in place. I was my own poor property manager. So lots of mistakes, right? Lots of lessons learned. And so uh, I purchased the property, rehabbed the property originally. And then when they moved out, it was probably worth what I originally purchased it for. This wasn't 2021, 2022 economy, mm -hmm. you know, housing. This was back in 2014 and 15. And so I was, I'm like, oh my gosh, all the rehab money's gone. I have made money on rent. It's basically just covered my rehab money, but that money was already gone. I was still growing my building company at the time. And uh, so I 
I didn't know what else to do, but I had invested in education. So I educated myself through a few mentors. I'd hire them. And one of the courses that I had taken was contract for deeds. And so I decided that this is the time to figure it out because this is a good tool for me to use in this type of situation. So my very first contract for deed happened to also be my very first rental. Um, and I converted the rental to a contract for deed. And essentially what that is and what we do is I sold the property as is to somebody else. Um, and they put, and I financed it for them. So I had already had commercial financing on it since it was a rental. I had already had it paid down a little bit. I mean, at least we're only talking two years of rental. Um, and so I, for round numbers, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I want to say I, I bought it for 60. I put 25,000 into it. Um, so it's really only still worth about 60, but I ended up being able to sell it for close to 90 because I could, I was financing it for somebody. So people are willing to pay more for the property because you're going to finance it. And there's a lot of people out there that can't get traditional financing. And when they can't get traditional financing, but they have a, a good amount of cash. So they are liquid. You know, there's a lot of people from my side, my blue collar construction side that make a lot of cash, make a lot of money, but they don't necessarily have the ability to go out and get a traditional loan or a mortgage or an FHA or even a commercial type loan. And so these people are looking for another way to one, build a rental portfolio or two, just have a house to live in themselves and add equity, add value to and live in it. Um, and so that, what I ended up doing is selling it to somebody for 90. They put $20,000 down and I carried the loan for them on a 25 year amateurization at a higher interest rate than what was at the time. And uh, so I was making cash flow. I made money right you know, down as his deposit because I had the equity. And uh, I mean, I turned a bad situation into a good situation just because I had invested in educating myself on another type of financial tool, real estate investing tool. I love it. You know, it's funny that I've been investing for about 10 years, but when I started doing the podcast, I felt like I started learning so many different things and I felt like my level of like, I just started getting a lot more creative because of all the education that we've done now. So how does a contract for deed differ from a wraparound mortgage and how does it differ from just traditional owner financing? Like, why is that different or how is that different? Um, so I never have personally done a wraparound mortgage, so I haven't dove deep into that. Um, but from traditional financing, essentially, you know, if somebody has enough liquidity to put down, so let's say 10% or um, like our minimum is kind of $10,000, but we're talking houses that are like $200,000 and less. Yeah. Um, but sometimes 10% of that, you know, is $20,000, obviously at $200,000. Um, but sometimes they come down and they put more, they put more money down. And uh, it, the difference is that you don't have, they don't have to go get qualified. We look at them as a renter. So we do qualify that they have a job, that they're going to be able to pay it. We don't want somebody to get into a situation where they're giving us that house back. We really don't. Um, but they don't have to go to an institution like a, fiduci a financial institution to go get this loan. They're going directly to us. And another huge benefit of it is um, they can close. Like if they go see the home, they like it, they can come to my office and close immediately. And so we don't, a contract for deed is exactly what it sounds like it is. It's a contract, a piece of paper for, and that says that you get the deed after you pay off the property based on the terms that we agreed on. And so that's essentially exactly what it is and i have my real estate attorney draft those contracts and agreements and it just shows that you know jose and austin agreed that uh we're gonna he's gonna purchase the property for x amount of dollars he's gonna put this much down he owes this much on the property over this period of time he can pay it off at any time he's gonna pay this interest rate and then if, if you pay it off early fantastic if you run the loan all the way out then that's fantastic as well but it's with me you pay me got it Okay, perfect. Now, um, in a traditional real estate transaction, it actually happens where if you're financing the loan for me, or if I'm buying a property from you, I actually get the deed immediately. So the difference is that you don't get the deed until it gets paid off at the very end. Um, Correct. The who, contract that you have is your basically your ownership instead of the deed, because they could, if I failed on my side, then they could take that contract and sue me, right? but they don't have the deed. They have no equitable interest when it comes to the deed. I mean, depending on your state and how the attorney looks at it, but yes. 
Got it. So um, at that point, does that mean that the seller remains on the title of the property? And is there any risk with the seller remaining on the title of the property? Like meaning, is there any risk that like the seller may get a child support lien or that the seller could get in a lawsuit and an attorney goes after uh, the seller um, if if the title hasn't transferred? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you want to work if you're going to do a, if you're the buyer of a contract for deed, you want to do your due diligence on the seller. You know, because um, that's one of the what that's a huge issue on in here in Oklahoma is I've actually purchased a property from somebody that told the people that they were buying the property and they had proof of a I don't know if it was a contract for deed or not, but uh, they didn't find they had nothing. It was clean title. And I purchased the property from this investor, allegedly investor, and he was double selling the property and they had paid the property off like over 10 years ago and he was trying to screw them. And so what we did is we just let them stay in it. We went back to the title company since we get title insurance on everything. And they were already suing him because he's sitting there selling the property that he, they should have ownership. He was taking advantage of, of immigrants essentially. And we don't, we don't do that. Obviously we were very upset with the situation. So we, we just went right back to title, got title insurance or had title insurance and then title attorneys took care of it and he had to pay us all back and them as well. So. That's crazy. So what's the right yep. way of doing the contract for deed? Obviously, that's the like the incorrect way right that's there. That's the crook oh. way of doing it, right? Yeah. That's the corrupt. That, that's the orange yeah. jumpsuit type of way of doing it. What yeah, would you absolutely. say the right pro, what would you say the right process? Like if I'm going to be doing a contract for deed as a seller to a buyer, and then also if I'm a buyer, what do I look out for to make sure that uh, I'm actually getting into contract because essentially what it sounds like is that a seller could get into contract with potentially multiple people because uh, because they're not actually getting the deed. Um, how does somebody protect themselves? Does this get recorded with the county at all? Or Yeah, they can record that document mm -hmm. right there. And, and sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Um, but the best for – so I'll go from a seller standpoint, so my standpoint – is you know essentially we have a rental property let's say just like my old scenario it's not renting or we don't want to fix it up anymore and somebody else can add equity to it they can go in and maybe they're a painter or they're a roofer or they're some kind of contractor which happens all the time and they mm -hmm. want to add value to this property so they'll be able to buy this property renovate this property how they see fit from us and and add value um, and so from my standpoint as a seller we sell this property to them and they can do whatever they want with it. We say, you're the owners, you know, don't call me if you have any roof problems, don't call me with anything. But as you said a minute ago, we still, we, what we do is essentially exactly what the bank does. And we, um, we uh, escrow the payment. So we hold, we still have title to the property. So we still have insurance on the property. We still cover everything and then we make them pay us that. Got and then it. if you're the buyer, the things that they need to watch out for is that it's a credible business. Because really you're buying, you're, you're buying based on an agreement, a piece of paper. And so you need to make sure that you have, like I've closed these with people that were a little bit um, more concerned at my, my real estate attorney's office so that they felt more secure. So I'm like, I, I have no problem. We'll schedule it over at my real estate attorney's office. You can talk to him. You can ask him any questions to complete third party. He's the attorney that drafted the document. It's at a title company in the same room that you'd close an actual real estate transaction at. And so um, if any of that situation is foggy for them, then I, I provide that. And I think that anybody that would be worried about providing that, they should be concerned about. Got it. Okay. And then um, as it relates to like, um, on, does everything else work out like a normal real estate transaction, meaning like the interest payments, do they get to deduct them on their taxes? If it's an investment property, do they participate in any, any of the depreciation or does that stay with the person that's on title at all? Or how, how does that process work? Or do we it stays with the person on title until they, until it's paid off? Cause what happens is they, once they get the D then essentially they absorb the property and it's free and clear. And so they'll be able to do whatever they need to from there, but they take title to it. They take ownership of it at that point. Got it. And then what about like, um, like, for example, like liens, can liens be put against the owner? Like, let's say that I own the rental property, I do a contract for deed uh, f for you. 
And then let's say that I get involved in a lawsuit, like a car accident, and somebody checks out the tax records and it shows me as the owner of this property, even though I have a contract for deed, is it, can somebody put a lawsuit against the property? And how does that affect the transaction at that point if somebody else had already bought it on paper, but the deed wasn't transferred at all? Or is that part of the due diligence process as well too, where you really have to make sure that you trust the company that's doing it? Because if not, there it, it could raise some potential liability. Yeah. So in general, you're right. They could, there, there could be some kind of lien put on the property for sure. Like on us as a company when they are the owner, but you, you definitely need to do your due diligence on the company itself. Um, but I, I know for a fact, just speaking to the attorneys through multiple situations like that one, and when they've drafted the documents that if that kind of scenario were to come up, that, 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 that specific property should be pulled off of any kind of lien or lawsuit type situation just due to the fact that that document holds up in the state of Oklahoma as ownership of the property or at least intent to have ownership. So basically the way that it's drafted, it's already like, no, look, you can't put a lien on me because I sold the property three years ago. Technically, this Correct. Is, the property is still under my name, but I'm technically not the owner of the right. property, basically. Yeah. Yep. Got it. And then as a seller, like, and I think this, you already answered it, or I already know the answer to this, but why is, what's the benefit to you of doing a contract for deed versus just kind of keeping the property as a rental property? One of the biggest and easiest things to figure out is that there's no maintenance. I mean, it's, right. it's, it's there's no maintenance. So, um, you can sell a property and we've sold turnkey properties too. So not all the properties need fixed up. They're not always equity. Some people see a property that we have for rent and they ask if they can buy it. We just happen to have another solution for that, which most rental companies don't. And um, so, or we've had tenants that have lived in the home for three, four years and they're like, Hey, we don't want to move. Would you guys ever sell this property? And so we write up an opportunity for them to buy the property and explain it to them. And as a contract for deed and if they accept it, then so be it um, good for them. Uh, but the benefits for us is just it's one more tool in our tool belt. That's one of the biggest mm -hmm. benefits to this. And I want to make sure that everybody watching this understands that you need to check your state laws, check with attorneys and really understand what you're getting into when you do these kind of things, because this isn't amateur investing. This is um, pretty you know, more advanced and savvy financial types of situations and in investing. Yeah, and it's funny because um, I was negotiating a owner financing deal with a seller and his thing was like, well, I'm concerned that if I give you the deed, now I have to go through a traditional foreclosure process, which could take a year if you ever miss a payment. So when you say that this is a tool in your tool belt, what I could have said that is like, well, what if we just do a contract for deed instead, meaning that you never transfer title to me. We have a document stating that I'm the owner of the property. I'm making payments to you. And that would have addressed that. So I think what Right. Austin here is saying is that as a real estate investor, if you have different options, and this is just one of those options for different situations, it can actually help you potentially um, do different creative things that would normally not allow you to uh, basically take advantage. So um, the question I had is, could you do a contract for deed if you already have existing finance on the property? And I think you might've mentioned this already. And if you already have existing finance, do, does the contract for deed terms on the loan have to be exactly the same as to what you already have? Or could you come up with your own like terms? Meaning if you have a 4% on your loan, could you charge 8% on the contract for deed if you wanted to? You can, you can, but you're going to need to make sure that you watch out for in your research, like Dodd-Frank laws and things like that. Because the, the I know that if you do have a mortgage on the property, and it's at like say four percent, and you're charging twenty percent interest. Then you have there are you know literature and legal documents, like I said, for in laws that have been passed so that you're essentially not taking advantage of people for that kind of stuff. Um, but you know all of that needs to be reviewed per your attorney per your state because the state changes so much and the rules change so much per state is what I mean. Yeah. What does the foreclosure process look like on a contract for deed? Like, let's say that you'd have to go through um, full foreclosure like they owned it, like you're the bank. Really? It would be the same process the bank goes through. Absolutely. Yeah. In the state of Oklahoma. Yeah. I'd have to foreclose, foreclose. I couldn't do you cannot do a uh, an eviction style. They have actual equitable interest when it comes to that document.
Got it. So it would be like the exact same thing as basically like a traditional foreclosure. So I guess if you have to go through the same thing as a traditional foreclosure, what's the benefit to the seller of not transferring the deed over if you still have to go through the foreclosure process? Like I would imagine that uh, part of the benefit would be if you never transfer the deed is that you don't have to go through a foreclosure process. I mean, I don't, I, I, to be honest, I don't know what the benefit would be because if you can't, you're right. It's kind of like, uh, yeah, it's it, to me that that was okay. So basically just whatever the foreclosure sense. process is at that point, you would just go through um, the same foreclosure process. Got it. Yeah. Perfect. Um, and then uh, once the owner makes the final payment, just, just at that point, the deed gets transferred over to the, to the new owner, if I'm understanding yes. correctly. Got it. Yep. Okay. Now they and then they can uh -huh. like, yeah they can file that document like I said so they can take that legal document that you have and file it and um it, it with the state and then that basically just um shows anybody who's doing research like a title search that you have the equitable um are there pros Correct. and cons to not filing it versus filing it like and what for us it would be easier if they didn't just just because it takes it's it, it's it shows up on, you know, county assessor and things like that, but it really doesn't matter. It doesn't affect us. I mean, we sold the property, so it wouldn't hurt me at all. I don't, I don't care. Okay. And then for the buyer, it, it, so it almost sounds like it would be a positive thing be for beneficial the buyer, to, the, to the buyer yeah. basically. Cause then at that point, if anybody's running a preliminary title report to see what loans or liens are on there, then at that point they would um, do it. Okay, good. You mentioned something about insurance earlier and you said that you pay for the insurance and yes. you pay for the property taxes as well too. We do. Um, yes. How does that? So we still. Can you explain that process? Do you guys get a, a mortgage servicer to uh, service the loan to the buyer, or how is that typically handled as well? No. So we have a we we'll have a a mortgage on the property. So we'll have debt on the property. They'll have debt with us on the property. We arbitrage the essentially what we pay versus what the what they pay. So like you said a minute ago, if we have a 4% interest rate, we can charge 8%. They come to the table with a larger down payment. Um, usually the property that we're talking about is a flip maybe that they wanted to purchase but didn't have the funding for. Um, and so they'll bring that cash to the table. And then um, as far as a mortgager, we do not use one though. We just do in-house bookkeeping and we provide documents and a uh, amortization type schedule for them on a monthly basis. Got it. Okay. And then um, what percentage of the time would you say that people um, basically default on any of these? Is this common at all that people will default on the very, contract? It's very you? rare. Yeah, it's very rare. Okay. I mean, so it, most... it does happen. And but, but in that type of situation, what we've done is we've offered to either renegotiate the terms because our objective isn't to take the property back and to move them out and to cause a bunch of things. So we're much more flexible when it comes to that type of situation than the bank is. Um, so, you know, if they say, well, we just can't make the payment anymore, or there's been scenarios where people are getting divorced, they're moving, they don't want the property, they want to do something else, then we would just give them you know, cash for keys. So the easiest thing for us is since we're a small business, not a big lending institution, we would just say, cool, just like we would a tenant, you know, here's a couple thousand dollars, go ahead and, you know, vacate the premises. Once you vacate the premises, we'll pay you and to get out. Then we don't have to go through, you know, eviction. I mean, not eviction. We don't have to go through foreclosure. On it, basically. Yeah. And it, and it helps them out massively because they're not going to have a foreclosure on their, you know, on yeah. their belt. Yeah, not only that, but for somebody like you, I think it helps you guys out as well too. Because oh, I yeah. think one of the one of the biggest complaints that I get from people as well too is, look, I don't want to be a landlord anymore. I don't want I want to have to worry about tenants, toilets, or anything like that. So for you guys, it's a business model that allows you to, um, it's a business model that allows you guys to still have rental income because you guys are arbitraging it or still have. Mm -hmm residual but not have to deal with any of the of the management attached to it now has your business model changed at all with interest rates being up because now that i'm kind of thinking about it i knew somebody that was doing something similar but 
they were getting 3% loans all day and arbitraging it at 8% and meaning getting the 5% spread and doing something similar where they were servicing it. Has that business model changed at all as a result of interest rates increasing or have you just had to make adjustments at all? At all? We've had to make adjustments, but just simply to our rates. And so if we're getting an 8% you know, interest rate, then we're going to have an 11% interest rate for them. And you know, 11% sounds crazy, but when anybody borrows hard money or you do any type of smaller deal, it's really not that crazy. And someone's looking at it like this. I'll give you a, 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 an example. If you're going to rent a house in Oklahoma. Mind you, I'm in Oklahoma, so everything's pretty affordable when it comes to what we have out there. And uh, so a sub $200,000 house, you're going to rent it for you know $1,800 a month, $1,500 a month, depending on where it is. And you could own the home for $1,500 a month, $1,800 a month, $150,000 house with an 11% mortgage. I mean, I'm not doing the calculations, right? Not right here in front of you, but your payment's essentially going to be the same as what a higher rent rate would be, but you're going to have ownership in a property. And so people see that and think, man, that's a much better deal. Yeah. So basically the key, the, one of the key components to making it a win-win is to have the mortgage be somewhat near what they would normally pay in rent, regardless of whatever the interest rate is. And that sounds like most people look at that as a no brainer, be like, well, why would I pay rent? Where over here I have yeah. an equitable interest. Yeah. I mean, three, three or $400 more a month is people are more likely to have no problem paying three or $400 more a month when they're going to own the property in the end of 20, 30 years. Got it. Now, um, whenever you're arbitraging the, um, the the loan meaning you have an existing loan and you're arbitraging it and over here you're charging something else are there certain lenders that allow you to arbitrage or are there do they not care because you're not transferring the deed or how does uh lender a do they have any preference or do they care at all if you're arbitraging the the loan there are there are definitely some that do so you need to read your loan documents and there are some that don't so much then there's some that are in the gray area basically like you keep making the payment and we don't care you know i've submitted contract for deeds for people on like a drco to drca type loan debt mm -hmm. service code ratio loan dscr and so okay. they're like oh, okay yeah perfect and then they'll judge it based off of that so i've submitted those documents some banks and then other banks like your typical mortgage brokers and things like that probably not but i haven't read through those documents and as most real estate investors we're not getting 30 year, you know, FHA type of loans. Got it. Okay, cool, man. Uh, anything else as it relates to this topic that you think would be helpful uh, to our viewers as it relates to contract for deed? Um, it's really just, it's really one of the tools, right? Like, so we run a full blown real estate investing firm. The majority of our business is fix and flips, buy and holds. And then that's just one of our other tools that we use. So it's not something that works for every deal. Um, when I've had students in the past that I've helped, you know, educate them on real estate investing, they, uh, they'll, they'll hear about that and get really excited because I just said, you don't have to maintain the property. You get a large lump sum of cash up front and you didn't have to fix it sometimes. And so people get really enamored and excited and it is great, but you have to understand which deal to do that with and which deal not to do that with. Um, yeah. And so just, just for everybody watching the video, this is, or listening, it's extremely important to know when to do that and when not to do that. Yeah. And it's funny, uh, Austin, cause I'm a licensed real estate agent and this is kind of what I notice with real estate agents. Like they only have one way of monetizing a deal. They're either thinking about, Hey, I'm going to help this person list the property or I'm going to help them buy. But what I'm kind of learning is just having different tools in your tool belt to be able to help different people in different situations. So the contract for deed is not going to be the right tool in every situation, but it's a tool that if used properly and done properly where you can make it a win-win for both the person buying it and the person selling it, it actually becomes a win-win uh, transaction for everybody. So um, I've enjoyed I've enjoyed the topic. Um, if somebody wanted to maybe get in touch with you or maybe learn a little bit more about contract for deed or wanted just to get to know you or wanted maybe for you to coach them on contracts yeah. for deed, do you offer any type of coaching? And also, how can people get a hold of you if they saw value in today's interview? Yeah, so uh, the best way to get a hold of me is through Instagram, austin.hancock1. 
And I do, I do educate people. I have quite a few students now. And um, what I do is essentially one-on-one -on -one coaching and we work together to help educate them. Everybody's in a different position, similar to what we were talking about with what you can do with the deal. You know, I have some people come to me that have their home paid off. They have a really large amount of cash in a 401k. They don't know anything about real estate investing. They're obviously good with money, but they're like, I want to, I want to 10, you know, I want to buy 10 single family homes the next year. And so we work differently with those people to go out and scoop up those properties and to educate them than we do with somebody that's, you know, $30,000 in profit for a flip would change their life this year. And so I, I ask people where they're at financially and I work with them one-on-one -on -one to get them either their first deal or scale their company. And the best way to reach out to me is essentially through Instagram is at my Instagram at austin.hancock1 and we'll just chat right there. And then the other thing about you, Austin, is that you do you also do wholesaling and flipping as well, too, or, 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 or no? We do some wholesaling. We do majority flipping. So we take title to most everything. I would say 90% of what we do is take we take title to now. We've done a lot of wholesaling in the past, um, but with my construction experience and background, it, it just makes sense for me to take almost everything down. And what we, we set up a, a criteria when we purchase these properties that that we really can't get hurt on them. So, you know, if we're purchasing it and it makes sense, very worst case scenario to put in our rental portfolio or to contract for deed, then we know that there's enough equity in there for us to fix it up and flip it. And so we have multiple buckets to put these deals in, which sets our criteria on what we'll actually take down, if that makes sense. Yeah, it basically gives you guys multiple exit strategies. Like, hey, look, if for whatever yeah. reason the flip didn't work, I can contract contract it for deed so it's basically a buy box that you guys have as to Correct. what matches 100%. that buy box anything else the reason i was asking if you guys wholesale is i know that prices for a lot of people in california are a lot less in oklahoma city so if they're looking to invest they could also reach out to you as well too and maybe absolutely you have yeah some sort of deal that you can give to them so um for our for viewers sure. out there if you've enjoyed this episode make sure to hit, the, hit that subscribe button if you feel that this episode will be helpful make sure to hit that share button as well Thanks again, Austin, and to our viewers, thank you so much as well, too, for uh, tuning in.